afternoon, whatever whatever time it may be. Welcome everyone um, to this webinar. This webinar is um, a part of a project that seeks to protect civic space um, through the use of strategic litigations, primarily via um, the regional mechanisms. Um, this project for the last six years has been funded and supported by the National Endowment for Democracy, and we are grateful for their ongoing and continued support to be able to bring um, events like this to everyone here across the African and Latin American and Americas and the world. Um, this, this project includes um, uh, a series of activities seeking to set new and better standards at the regional and international level to protect civic space and the freedoms of assembly and association and expression. Um, uh, and uh, that's why we're here today to discuss one of these cases um, that has been a part of this project, a very special case um, to many of us. Um, in fact, all of the participants in today's webinar had some hand uh, in some shape or form in informing and in informing and in advocating uh, and in promoting the, the new decision that was reached uh, in this case before the African Commission. Um, the case, of course, would not have been possible um, without just the tremendous and courageous work of um, the women of Zimbabwe Arise and, and Jenny Williams in particular, who's the executive director of WOZA, uh, who we hope to hear from later this, this, this afternoon, this, this morning. Um, the, the, the tireless and courageous efforts to take to the streets to mobilize in peaceful demonstration in Zimbabwe against very surreal and, and hard opposition and suppression and violence. Um, the, their work forms the seed of what we were able to do as advocates in representing them and their cause before the African Commission. And they were able to help set new precedent that we'll discuss here today that can be used both in the African regional system and the American system and around the world for the furtherance and the protection and the expansion of our ability to protect civic space, particularly the right to protest. Uh, before we get started, uh, I just wanna thank um, our partners and our co-hosts on this call, um, ICNL and Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights. Um, Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, along with RFK Human Rights, were the legal representatives of WOZA, in this case, before the African Commission. Uh, and to all our panelists, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing this time and your experience and expertise um, with this audience. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to turn um, the speaker role over to Irene Petras from ICNL. Thank you so much, Irene. Great, thank you so much, Wade. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who has joined us from all around the globe uh, for this webinar, which I think is going to be very exciting. Um, as Wade has said, this is a case from the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, but just for logistics, um, if you're tuning in and you need interpretation, please look for the little globe at the bottom of your screen. You can click it and then press on English or Spanish, um, depending what language you would like to hear the interpretation. Um, as Wade said, I'm Irene uh, Petras. I um, with ICNL, the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, um, on the Africa program. And we're also very interested in this case, which is one of the first in which the African Commission uh, looked at the guidelines on freedom of association and assembly in Africa. Um, these guidelines, uh, some of the, the panelists that you'll hear from today, including the UN Special Rapporteur, uh, were instrumental in, in pushing this normative framework. And it's very interesting um, to see how the Commission has reflected on these guidelines um, in, in the course of, of this case. So um, the, the, the case itself uh, is about the right to protest. Um, you'll hear more about it from the different panelists. Um, the African Commission found in this case um, that the government of Zimbabwe had um, violated the complainant, which was the women of Zimbabwe Arise, 
their rights to freedom of association, assembly and expression. And they recommended that the government should investigate and prosecute and punish state actors who were responsible for the violations, but also engage in uh, legal reform and also human rights training for law enforcement agents on the right to protest and how to facilitate that. So today we're gonna to be looking at that, seeing uh, how it measures up regionally, listening to international experiences, um, and uh, we're looking forward to a good uh, uh, discussion. If you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We have quite a number of panelists, so we are going to try and take um, all of the um, the interventions first, write your questions. There are people who will be uh, collecting the questions and then we will have time for interaction and to hear some of the responses to the questions as we go along. Um, so let's uh, then uh, go straight into the first speaker's presentation. Uh, we're very honored today to have the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to peaceful assembly and association, Mr. Clément Voulet. Um, the Special Rapporteur Voulet is known to most of us for his exceptional and long-standing work on civic space generally, and a lot of work that has gone into um, looking into guidance for the right to protest, um, a friend to human rights defenders and to civil society. Um, so, Mr. Voulet, I'm going to give you 15 minutes and I'll hand the floor over to you now. Uh, we'll put the bio for the Special Rapporteur in the chat for those who would like to read a bit more um, about Mr. Voulet. Thank you, Clement. Please take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, um, Irene. And uh, let me first thank all the organizers of this uh, uh, important uh, uh, working uh, around the African Commission decision um, regarding uh, Zimbabwe and also um, say that uh, this is an important issue that um, uh, has to be discussed in terms of uh, the, the regime that will govern the right to peaceful assembly. And um, my, my introductory remark will focus mostly on this decision. I know that there are um, they, 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 they are already some aspects that are pushed for this, this uh, lobby, uh, and also uh, have full content of this decision. I am going to apologize that I haven't been able really to go to the decision, but I think one of the subjects of this discussion is really to um, to understand um, the regime of authorization versus the regime of notification, which I will, I, I will focus on. Uh, again, thanks to uh, Kennedy Center, ACNL, and, and Zimbabwe lawyers, but also other that are involved in this, uh, in the preparation of this meeting and invite me. Um, let me say that um, under the international law, the right to peaceful assembly, uh, is the fundamental freedom uh, that is guaranteed under the Article 21 of the International Covenant and Civil and Political Act, but also in other instrument methods that uh, are relevant, even if they are still soft, some of them are soft law, but they are relevant. And as a such, the right to peaceful assembly um, should be enjoyed by any citizen really without any permission. That, because you don't need permission to enjoy your fundamental freedom. Um, however, we know that when it comes to the right to peaceful assembly, uh, one of the ways in which um, many governments restrict the enjoyment of the, these rights is to put in place what we call the regime of um, authorization. And I, I will talk a little bit about, the, 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 from my perspective, what we would be I witnessed as a, a as a manifestation of this regime of authorization. But I just want to also to say that from the perspective of the rapporteur and also committee, human rights committee and uh, 
and another special procedure, this regime um, is not conducive to the enjoyment, to the full enjoyment of the right to peaceful assembly. This is why we are advocating for many years to see countries that have a such regime in place uh, to move at most to the regime of notification, which we think that at least uh, can be is acceptable uh, and and it will be can be compared as in line with uh, with the international uh, human rights standard. Um, as I mentioned, we are seeing around the world the, the, the really uh, restrictions uh, on uh, the right to peaceful assembly, and and one of the one of the ways, like I mentioned, is is, is that states through laws are putting in place through law or other policies are uh, put in place this regime, which is the regime that prevents people really to exercise. What are some of the manifestations of this regime? Um, the first thing, uh, and what, what, what I think is, uh, is the consequences of why this regime is in contradiction with uh, the, the, the full enjoyment of this right. The first is that the regime of authorization uh, is the regime where uh, states, uh, where any organizer of the meeting will have to, to request permission before organizing or before enjoying its own fundamental freedom, which is the right to peaceful assembly. And in such a regime, authorities have control on, on which protest they will allow because of the law requires that anybody can, anybody who wants to organize assembly have to go through the process of authorization. The authority have control on which assembly to allow and which to refuse. And we saw that in most of, in, in, in many cases, states will always find arguments or find a way to refuse protests that tend to criticize the bad governance in the country or protests that have uh, 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 aim is to challenge the policy of the government or sometimes also protests that um, is not seen as a protest that is in line with culture or practice in the country or what people would define as protection of the culture itself, meaning that the, the, the protests around abortion or protests around LGBT issues. So you will see that in, in, in this such regime, the first barrier really is the state who will allow you to protest and who will decide which protest. And we have seen that this, uh, this, this type of regime also uh, empower uh, discrimination, empower also exclusion, because in most of the cases, the protests organized by marginalized groups will not be accepted uh, under the pretext of national security, moral, or any other, other pretext. And another also aspect of this regime, which is also um, uh, not conducive to the enjoyment of this, uh, this fundamental freedom is also the burdensome requirement that is put on the organizer. In some countries, for example, uh, they, uh, before the states permit or the states allow the, the, money, the protest to go or to be organized, uh, states will, for example, request the organizer to meet some condition. The first one being like they need to have their own, uh, they need to, to provide uh, a proof that the protest will not become violent, which is the first step of really uh, challenging because how can you uh, uh, think, how can you give this proof that your protest will not be violent? The second aspect sometimes is also that it is a law enforcement will request you to have your own security, your own security, meaning also that a protest maybe that will be organized by um, by uh, indigenous people, by marginalized group, will not because not, they will not have enough resources to be able to have their own security. And state will argue that this is to protect protesters, but also to avoid any violence. And we receive some uh, some communication around that where people complain about the fact that. Um, states uh, uh, insist and, and, and that law enforcement to request them to have their, 
their own security, which is in contradiction, even by many constitutions, even that do not provide that. Then uh, we have also uh, another, another step in this is also that state will even ask some of the organizers that after the protests, they should have um, in place a system to clean the road. And this is also adding another type of another type of complication, another type of barrier also for the for the organizer. And this have this kind of uh, um, uh, chilling effect because if you know uh, you don't have resources, you don't have uh, you can meet all these requirements, you better not organize uh, protests. So, and another aspect that is important also to highlight here, which is, which uh, we receive sometimes quite a lot of. Um, uh, concern around that is the criminal liability of the organizer. In the regime of the authorization, in some countries, it means that when you go before before the, the government or the law enforcement give you the authorization, they also make it clear that if there is any violence, you will be responsible as organizer, which is in contradiction with uh, general comment, with other, uh, with also <laughs> the enjoyment of these rights itself as provided by the international uh, inter international uh, 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 norms. And the consequence of that is that uh, in case there is a violence, in case uh, there is an um, act of violence, then the organizer will be responsible of, uh, of violence, even if they are not themselves individually, uh, 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 they didn't individually commit those violence, but they will be both responsible of that. And in this regime also, one of the things that is important also to highlight is that it is also, uh, because this regime requires authorization, automatically, if you don't have authorization and you organize a protest, your protest can be seen as uh, unauthorized protest and automatically allow law enforcement to request the protest. So this regime also empower law enforcement in repressing protests, even if the even if the protests do not lead to the violence, so this regime uh, that's why we are saying that this regime is not conducive to the exercise of this fundamental freedom, and also that, that the organizer will also face besides the criminal responsibility, they will also uh, face heavy fine in case uh, there is act of violence or even sometimes in some country in case. Uh, some participants do not follow the itinerary that was uh, agreed between uh, 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 law enforcement and, uh, and the organizer. So we have many of these cases that we, 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 we deal with every day, and I'm sure that my, those who will come uh, after me will kind of bring some of these cases, cases but uh, since they are spread around the world, and, and, and also not only uh, in authoritarian regime, in even in some democratic regime, we have we are also seeing some of these uh, wave or some of these uh, 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 laws that request uh, protesters to have uh, 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 to, to, to request permission before the the, the before the protest. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the one of for us and, uh, and, 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 and for the Human Rights Committee, one of the regimes that can be at least allowed or acceptable is the regime of notification. However, I would like also to say this, and while the regime of notification is the regime that is in the, is in the regime that all where states or participants or organizers are encouraged to, to notify and uh, to have clear notification of their protest to the law enforcement with the purpose that law enforcement will take necessary measures to facilitate the protest. We have seen, we have seen that some of this regime in many cases, uh, like in Niger, in, 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 in Zimbabwe, this regime of notification, which normally is just information to the law, to the authorities, to take necessary measures to protect, but this regime is uh, uh, used as a regime of, uh, of authorization by putting again some of the requirements to the organizer before, even if before even the uh, 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 law enforcement give you your hope, they are they are in line to protest. 
We saw this in, in many jurisdictions uh, that at the same time that the law say uh, you need just to notify. It also provides that in notifying uh, law enforcement, you should provide this uh, ABC condition and give also the power for law enforcement that in some circumstances, as uh, allow, as, as um, allowed under the international norms, law enforcement may refuse you the, the, the right to protest on the basis of national security or, uh, or health emergency or any other um, other uh, requirement that is provided under the international uh, in the component. So this is abusively used in, in many jurisdictions and sometimes also, um, even if laws also allow you, for example, to, to file uh, a case or to file complaint uh, against the government, government refusal for you to protest within a certain time, usually uh, the, the decision to refuse or to notify you that you are not allowed to, 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 uh, uh, to protest is given to the protester at the last minute, which do not allow them really to fit within the requirement, which is sometimes maybe uh, uh, 36 hours uh, to be able to complain before uh, the judge, the judge to, to reverse the decision of not uh, allow you to protest. So I would like also to say here that um, uh, that's uh, in a joint report that uh, this mandate and the mandate of the uh, a summary execution uh, uh, and uh, uh, highlights it in, uh, in, uh, in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. It was clear, and, and, and this joint report mentioned that the failure to notify authority of an assembly does not render assembly unlawful. But this is what we are noticing because of the fact that people are not able to notify or people do not meet the notification requirements, sometimes law enforcement will declare this assembly as unlawful and by, the, by, 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 and, and by consequence will repress them. So the report also say clearly that where there has been a failure to properly notify organizer, community or political leaders should not be subject to criminal or administrative sanction resulting in fine imprisonment. And the Human Rights Committee also reiterated that, that the regime of notification is a regime that uh, is there to allow law enforcement to prepare. And the fact that people didn't notify, is not, it doesn't mean that they don't anymore have the right to protest or their protest is become unlawful. So the committee also reiterates that's a failure to notify, and, and in particular in, in the general comment 37, it, a failure to notify the authority of an upcoming assembly where required does not render the act of participants in the assembly unlawful and must not in itself be used as a basis for dispersing the assembly or arresting the participant or organizer or for imposing undue sanction such as charging the participant or organizer with criminal offense. And also the general comment also add that any notification regime should exclude assembly for which the impact of a gathering on other can reasonably be expected to be minimal, for example, because of its nature, location or whatever. Meaning that this regime of notification should not be systematic. For example, an assembly that do not has, doesn't have a big size, there is no need really for the notification. But we are seeing that the notification in many countries become more authorization because the way that state is using some of the, 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 this regime. So in, in, in some, just to end, to say that um, this, the regime of uh, authorization, while we, we are pushing, to see it become more states to adopt more the regime of notification, we still have to be careful that many states, even they put in their law, that they have in place a regime of the notification, but in practice, this regime of notification is the same as a regime of authorization, which sometimes also contradicts and, 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 and is, a, is, is, in, a, is in, a, in, in contradiction with the uh, spontaneous protest, which is recognized by the international laws. 
So let me maybe end there and saying that um, my mandate trying to advocate to ensure that the regime of notification uh, should be applied as it's understood under the international norm, which means that the purpose of notification is really to allow law enforcement to take uh, proper measures to protect and facilitate assembly and that the notification will not render any uh, assembly unlawful. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy also to, to really um, keep in uh, for clarification. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clement. Uh, Clement Voulet, that, and we hear about um, how the UN system views notification um, versus authorization, the same as we've now seen in the case um, that we're examining and interrogating today. I know the UN and the African Commission on Human and People's Rights work closely together. So I think there's a lot of opportunities around this case and you know, potential advocacy using the UN standards and the ACHPR standards and, and decisions as well um, to really advocate for, um, you know, for, for, for this change, especially in countries that continue to um, misinterpret or um, to put in place some of these um, restrictive laws. Um, so thank you very much, um, Clément. We, we will come back to you with some questions. Those in the audience, please remember, if you have questions, you can drop them in the, in the chat. Um, but now what I'd like to do is turn um, to Jenny Williams, um, who is the executive director of the Women of Zimbabwe Arise, WAZA, um, which, as you've heard, is the organization that was at the center of this um, landmark decision by the African Commission. So Jenny, welcome. It's been a long time since I've seen you. It's good to see you. And please um, take us away for the next 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, lovely to see some old friends who uh, helped to get me out of jail on many occasions. Thank you, uh, Irene. Uh, yes, the uh, was a woman adopted the right to protest as the way in which they could ventilate their social justice issues uh, within a framework where Zimbabwe was closing uh, space uh, around 2002, 2003. Um, a lot of the work uh, that we did um, was not captured in the case. Basically what we tried to look at is um, a certain array of different arrests with different outcomes and different results that we could then use to uh, argue for our, rec our proposed recommendations uh, in the case. Um, uh, I would really like to, to take the time to thank uh, Lawyers for Human Rights and uh, the Robert F. Kennedy Center for assisting us through that process. The information we had was uh, uh, enormous, the amount of arrests, the amount of persecutions, uh, and to condense all that information into something that would pass admissibility and something that would then go on to be able to be um, winnable within the African Commission for Human and People's Rights Framework was indeed a challenge. Uh, it was quite a victory when we did manage to pass admissibility. Um, the decision coming almost 10 years after we took the case um, was, uh, was a little bit of a disappointment for us, but uh, we had been prepared that it would take a long time. Uh, I think for, for, for me, what I would really like to maybe focus uh, uh, more on and, uh, and, and share is that as, as WASA members, when we received the uh, communication uh, late last year, and we met and uh, studied it through and uh, looked at uh, what had occurred even after we had submitted the communication and the continued abuse of our right to protest and the continued abuse of our right to protest as women and as uh, primarily members of minority groupings here in Zimbabwe. We then also felt that we were justified in taking the case. And we also felt that it was very important that the African Commission resolved that there should be some form of redress and also the issue of uh, trainings for police. 
Uh, we feel that Zimbabwe, despite um, winning this case, has retrogressed uh, from when we took it to when we got the decision. And even since we got the decision, there has been a steady retrogression in the right to protest. For Wazo, I think what was key is we felt that um, we, we understood that the uh, decision is not um, uh, a ruling. Uh, it is not recognized by law. It is merely a human rights communication. But we felt that the length and the long suffering that we, we went through to get that communication, that we should be able to engage the Zimbabwean government and we should be able to engage them in such a way that we could understand that this is what has, the outcome is. This is how the African Commission for Human and People's Rights viewed it. And how do we as Zimbabweans together come up with a way that WOZA and its membership can receive redress? How do we correct the injustice? How do we then deal with making Zimbabwe an example, a stunning example in how the right to protest can be properly respected, protected, and it uh, be fully uh, fulfilled? Uh, we wrote letters to the Minister of Justice, uh, who are the lead um, in, in uh, engaging in the African Commission for Human and People's Rights. We uh, further copied the letters. We submitted additional copies. We went uh, bravely into the Commissioner of Police's uh, office. We delivered the letters there. We delivered the letter to headquarters. We delivered the, delivered the letters to the local police station. Uh, we then continued to receive no replies at all, even after our press conferences, after our other uh, phone calls, we got no replies. And up to today, I must tell you, it's a shame for me as a Zimbabwean, and it also should be a shame on the Minister of Justice, Minister Ziambi Ziambi, that they haven't even bothered to reply to our letter. Uh, even the per Permanent Secretary, Virginia Mabiza, has been reminded, we've asked for meetings, there has been no engagement. We then also looked at the Chapter 12 organizations in Zimbabwe. We shared with them the full, we did many uh, hundreds and hundreds of photocopies of the full 36 page uh, communication. We then engaged the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission we asked them to please also um, accompany us as we tried to do this engagement. We fe felt that as the Human Rights Commission is mandated to protect all the rights of uh, citizens of Zimbabwe, that they may be well placed to be able to accompany WOZA as we engage with government in a spirit of dialogue. Uh, we had meetings with them. We uh, were asked for more copies, we were asked for the admissibility documents, we speedily replied to all communications. However, on the 4th of May, we were then uh, quite surprised to receive a letter from the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission, which uh, basically I can read to you one of the key sentences here. It says, the Commission notes your request to Zimbabwe Human Rights uh, Commission to play a facilitation mediation role regarding implementation of the decision by the African Commission for Human and People's Rights on the Right to Protest. However, statutory instrument 77 of 2016 empowers the commission to track its own recommendations, decisions and recommendations made by regional and international bodies in favor of particular organizations require direct engagement with the government of Zimbabwe, which is the duty bearer. So basically the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission saw no way in which they could play a role in helping us to engage the Zimbabwean government and actually even quoted the instruments. And it's quite a strange communication which uh, you know, we would need to be able to, to further ventilate and ask because it doesn't seem that the commission who make pronouncements every other day on all sorts of things, including, I think I've seen a, a, commun a communication from them regarding the Patriot Bill, that they should then blithely write us such a letter and actually indicate that they have no way in which to engage. And actually they didn't even bother to acknowledge this landmark ruling. So um, 
for Rosa, we, we find ourselves um, with an incredible victory and we, 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 we bear no grudge. We feel that even if in Zimbabwe it is not meaningful for us, we feel so confident that the Special Rapporteur and all the organizations that have hosted this meeting will try to make sure that this ruling can result in the right to protest being enjoyed within the region and internationally. So we know that some way, some people somewhere will still enjoy that right because of the sacrifices of uh, the Waza members uh, over this long period. But um, yes, I will make this uh, letter available, um, taking no prisoners on it because the Human Rights Commission, I feel should know better. Um, we, we really would be interested to engage anyone who is interested uh, to help us to find a way in which we can um, make this, these recommendations more meaningful for us. How do we get redress? We suffered long and hard. Unfortunately for us, uh, none of our arrests, including those uh, constitutional victories we scored, none of them were ever, um, ever resulted in us taking uh, direct action against the police for the excesses. So we never managed to receive any compensation for any of the rights. So other than this uh, ruling um, in our back pockets um, and thanks to everyone who assisted us to get it, uh, was I will just um, be unable to secure any redress and then unable to enjoy the right to protest as uh, the African Commission blessed us. I thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, very interesting to hear the perspective from those who um, actually, you know, were at the heart of, 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 um, of this case. And, um, you know, hearing about some of the ways, the challenges that face litigants in some of these mechanisms um you know to to be able to implement so i think implementation is is obviously um a challenge um very interesting to hear about um the human rights commission so it gives us food for thought about the role of national human rights institutions in um, this implementation um, of decisions um you know, and we need to think a little bit more about how we can make these recommendations um, a bit more meaningful. I know that there is also a working group at the African Commission which follows up on recommendations and implementation. That's possibly one way in which to, to follow up at that level. Um, but I think it, you know, it kind of calls us to continue with the advocacy and find more innovative ways to engage on that. Um, so food for thought, if, the, if, you know, if people have ideas and suggestions, questions, please note them down. Um, I'm going to turn now um, to our next speaker, um, Rose Hansi. Um, she's the Executive Director at Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, which is a leading human rights organization in Zimbabwe and one of the legal representatives for WASA in the communication. So Rose, um, the floor is yours. Please take us away. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, good evening to everyone who is following this from around the world. I want to start off by thanking the conveners of this uh, online session, um, International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, and also RFK, yeah, human rights. Thank you very much for convening this. I think uh, it's quite critical that we have this discussion on the victory that we secured uh, at the African Commission um, after eight years having filed this uh, communication in 2013. Due to the timing that we find ourselves in as a country, I think it's quite critical that we discuss uh, this um, decision but also due to the developments that we continue to see uh, in Zimbabwe. And also just to add that um, two months ago, we celebrated uh, 10 years of uh, the constitution of Zimbabwe coming into force. And this constitution was adopted uh, in 2013, just around about the time when uh, 
the commission became seized with this communication. Zimbabwe lawyers for human rights uh, has been uh, existing since um, 2 February 1996. And uh, throughout the years, we have managed to assist uh, thousands of uh, human rights defenders who have come in conflict uh, with uh, law enforcement for asserting their rights, um, particularly the participation rights. Uh, it has always been contentious um, when human rights defenders express themselves, uh, whether they're expressing themselves through sharing information, ideas, or through peaceful protest is what um, the women of Zimbabwe Arise uh, had been doing. And I must also add that um, the women of Zimbabwe Arise uh, had been very resilient. I understand that Jenny was arrested uh, many times, um, many, many times. I think um, she didn't mention that, but uh, a lot of times she was arrested, but continued to be resilient in asserting her right uh, to peaceful protest. Before I get into the issues that I want to raise about our reflections on this um, development and what we see on the ground and maybe some recommendations, I would want to start off by saying that um, I understand that this is a public event and I do hope that uh, we have some people, uh, particularly from the government of Zimbabwe, who have managed to register and follow this discussion. And uh, as I'm going to be presenting, I also want to place it on record, and I'm glad that this is being recorded, that I'm also fully aware that uh, the United Nations has passed uh, numerous um, resolutions around uh, the protection of human rights defenders, especially when they are cooperating with the United Nations mechanisms uh, and other processes of uh, the United Nations. And uh, the last report that was issued by the United Nations uh, Secretary General was issued uh, on 14 September 2022. And in that report, uh, the Secretary General identified a high number of uh, threats, attacks, aimed uh, at retaliating against defenders and discouraging cooperation with the United Nations. It's good that uh, at this platform, we also have uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur, uh, Monsieur Clément Voulet. Uh, and I believe that uh, whatever statements have been made by my client, um, Jenny Williams, uh, on behalf of herself and uh, on behalf of uh, the women of Zimbabwe Arise, have been said in the spirit of cooperating with uh, the United Nations as well as the partners that have convened uh, this session. I would also want to add that um, because of the recent developments uh, that occurred six days ago, uh, I would not want to be a statistic, neither would I want uh, Jennifer Williams to be a statistic uh, in the annual report uh, that the Secretary General issues. So I just wanted to make that very clear. The Constitution of Zimbabwe that was adopted in 2013 lays a foundation uh, which could actually then spare the reforms um, and some of the recommendations that were made by the African Commission, particularly looking at this critical decision that was passed um, in 2021. Some of the key rights that are provided in the constitution that I would want just to highlight is particularly on the rights uh, to freedom of expression, uh, which I believe can be done in different ways. Uh, even through protests, it's a form of expressing content. Uh, and um, categorically, the Constitution says that every person has the right to expression and the right to seek and receive information, communicate idea information. And it also goes further to grant the right in terms of when uh, the freedom of expression cannot be asserted or demanded. This Constitution, that is 10 years now, uh, provides for the right to freedom of assembly and association. And it also provides uh, and guarantees the right to demonstrate and petition as the standalone right, which we have never had. And looking at uh, what came out of the African Commission and the recommendations that were made, it should fairly be simple for the government to look into how they can then actually implement and enforce uh, some of uh, the recommendations made in that um, decision particularly around how the rights to demonstrate and petition 
can actually be protected by those who are supposed to be ensuring that it's enjoyed, particularly the law enforcement agents. I know that I genuinely am saying that they probably will not be able to take action against the police, but we need to continue to push and advocate. And for those that find themselves in similar situations, for reforms within particularly the law enforcement agents and in Zimbabwe, six days ago, um, the president signed uh, amendments to the Criminal Law Codification and Reform Act. Uh, these amendments were introduced uh, in December 2022. And basically, the gist of these amendments is uh, to introduce what they call patriotism um, in terms of some of the provisions. Uh, one said that uh, Zimbabwean citizens like myself and uh, my client, Jane Williams, uh, love our country. Unfortunately, the provisions that I introduced uh, will make it very difficult uh, for the continued assertion of some of the participation rights that I alluded to. Particularly, demonstrate, petition, assemble, associate, because of the vague amendment to the criminal code. What we find particularly problematic is that um, you can be found guilty of willfully damaging the sovereignty or national interest uh, of the country. And uh, the sovereignty or national interests are not defined. Uh, there are some explicit clauses on certain issues like um, where you advocate for sanctions, trade embargoes, uh, or where you advocate for military intervention. But generally the concern is around some of the vague provisions. So we tend to see that uh, with the passing of this bill, uh, most of the actors in Zimbabwe are acting with caution. Um, there is a closure of civic space. And I'm glad that this uh, session and the project that uh, RIFK is working on is on civic space. So I hope that uh, the comments that we are making here uh, um, that I've made and uh, that James have made uh, has made uh, have not upset the government because it's a crime under that statement. I mean, it's not justice. So I just want uh, to make that very clear that uh, Zimbabwe is uh, show how uh, some of the issues raised by Jane Williams have uh, actually proceeded. So there are two significant events that are happening or that have happened, uh, the passing of the criminal code amendment with the vague uh, provisions. And obviously, uh, ordinarily, I think those that know me know that I'm not afraid to get arrested. I was actually arrested in 2009 with uh, some members of the Women of Zimbabwe Arise and prosecuted when they were um, arrested for actually having conducted a peaceful protest. Uh, around Valentine's Day. So I've been arrested before and um, I do anticipate that I can be arrested because of this new law. But why I would not want to be arrested and why I've put this um, before the audience around the reprisals and the protection, which may be limited because there's so much that the United Nations could do to influence the domestic processes, especially if someone gets arrested, is that on 23 August um, 2023, uh, Zimbabwe is going to vote and uh, obviously that's one of uh, the participants. Uh, my client assets uh, to choose, uh, participate in the government of the country by choosing a representative of uh, choice. So this case I said, um, we filed uh, with RIFK in 2018 uh, and um, the decision came out in 2021, uh, rather delayed, but uh, better late than never. So other than the legal issues that I've alluded to, I also just want to say that um, one of the laws that, were, that was being used to persecute the women of Zimbabwe arise, the Public Order and Security Act was repealed and uh, it was replaced uh, with uh, the Maintenance of Peace um, Act, Maintenance of, Maintenance of Peace and Order Act, which uh, from the cases that we have done of representing human rights defenders, has not really been applied in the same way as uh, they used to apply the Public Order and Security Act in the form of uh, 
arresting several people around uh, failing to notify. We have not really seen that happening a lot. But what we have seen in terms of application of uh, the maintenance of peace um, and order act is that um, they have basically been um, arresting people who have um, participated or groups of people that have participated in protests that are peaceful and then charging them with um, inciting public violence in the criminal code. They don't charge them with uh, not notifying the police. So the modus operandi has changed. And then I also just wanted to highlight uh, a few of the prominent cases that we have done where people are charged with um, inciting public violence for having peacefully protested. Uh, there was a case of Ivan Mawarire who was um, pushing this flag as a campaign and as a form of protest around how there was need for reforms in the country in 2017. And then we also had uh, the arrest of uh, the prominent Sisidangarebwa and uh, her colleague who had just conducted a very peaceful protest in 2020. Uh, she was for convicted. We appealed and that was overturned. But the charge was actually inciting public violence. It was not about not notifying. So they've changed the modus operandi. And then in 2019, we also had several cases of people who were arrested. Some had participated in protests, some had not participated in protests, where they were protesting against um, the economic um, regression, particularly because the fuel uh, prices had been escalated to unsustainable levels, and over 1,400 people were arrested. There were a few, of course, uh, rogue um, uh, people who participated in uh, violent protests, but the majority of those that we represented, uh, in fact, 100% um, of those that we represented either had not participated in the protest or had been peaceful in the participation during the protest. The other cases that we continue to note regrettably is that uh, union leaders continue to be arrested. Uh, we have uh, the Amalgamated Rural Teachers Union. Um, as late as uh, September, sorry, January 2022, we had 16 uh, amalgamated Royal Teachers Union members being arrested for having conducted a peaceful protest. And again, they were charged with participating in a gathering with intent to cause uh, public violence. So uh, I think uh, we can see that uh, they've sort of like reinvented uh, the way that they are going to be charging. And then we also had students arrested in July 2022 for having conducted the fees must fall protest. The only time that I want to highlight where the police have actually arrested people and then uh, accused them of not notifying them was actually when someone was conducting a meeting, uh, which was um, members of uh, an organization that uh, deals with the rights of young women, which is the Institute um, of Young Women in Development, where the members were arrested on 29 July uh, and accused of violating the Maintenance of Peace and Order Act. So, um, Maybe going ahead, I think um, more can be done. And also we need to be mapping how the law enforcement or the governments are reinventing or rather re-strategizing the way that they deal with some of these issues. So in Zimbabwe, for instance, uh, the issue of um, the notification regime for protests is not really something that uh, we are considering at the moment as we have seen that uh, the trends have changed. And uh, also to continue to see how we can advocate for reform, particularly of uh, the law enforcement, uh, where there is a constitutional provision where they should be complying, uh, maintaining, maintaining law and order, but also abiding uh, by the constitutional provisions, Bill of Rights on Bill of Rights, uh, then uh, we should see how we can continue to advocate for that. Um, basically, these are my reflections. And I, I do hope that, um, uh, We'll continue to engage on this issue. And I'm very happy that you convened uh, this uh, meeting, particularly given the recent developments and also given uh, the developments that we are going to have uh, on 23 August. Thank you very much for the Thank opportunity. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, and an interesting angle there to see how um, oftentimes, you know, Governments can adapt the way that they are implementing laws or using different laws um, to restrict rights. So I think that's something that we do need to think about. Um, it's good, I think, that there's monitoring and documentation which is going on. Jenny also spoke about 
um, the documentation and the amount of information that is available. I think that's really important in terms of kind of mapping the trends and being able to show that, um, you know, how laws um, are being used and, and possibilities of where they should be reformed. So I, I think there's a lot of food for thought. Um, if anyone has got questions, please put them in the chat. I know that Rose has to leave a bit early. So if you want to put some questions in the chat, perhaps she can answer them in the chat. Um, otherwise, we're going to move now to our final speaker, um, Sophia Haramio. Um, she's a senior staff attorney for civic space at RFK Human Rights. And together with Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, RFK Human Rights litigated the WASA case. So, Sophia, thanks very much. Um, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Um, thank you, Irene. Can you hear me correctly? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to share this space of reflection with such brilliant and courageous advocates. Thank you again for your time and basically your intellectual generosity with all of us. Um, so in these brief 10 minutes, uh, just because we wanna start ha have some time engaging with the public and have some dialogue among us, um, I wanna take a, basically a step back or better like a zoom out of the African continent and into the Americas. Um, I will attempt to do three things. First, um, briefly highlight some of the main points of the decision of the African Commission. And in parallel, second, I will try to, like just in tandem, to first point out whether the American human rights system has addressed those issues and how they have done this. And uh, a third part of my presentation will be just some brief reflections on how we can basically benefit from a cross-regional collaboration and strengthening on, on standards, also building from uh, what Clement, uh, the Special Rapporteur Clement Boulay mentioned at the beginning. So without further ado, I will, my, the three main points that I wanna highlight of the, that was a decision from the African Commission. The first one will be that the decision talks about the close link and the disinterrelation of the rights to freedom of expression, assembly and association. And we've heard a little bit about that uh, from Rose's presentation. Um, the commission mentioned that these rights are intertwined to the extent that they're just basically fundamental human rights that formed all this, the foundations of a, of a democratic society. Um, while the inter-American human rights system doesn't have like a rich jurisprudence, a rich case law on the right to protest, it has reiterated this point several times. Um, for example, in the case of victims of sexual violence in Atenco, a case against Mexico, the Inter-American Court did recognize that the right to assembly is just fundamental for a democratic society and it allows individuals to claim and to voice and to protect other rights. Uh, this was a case where the Inter-American Court found that Mexico had violated the human rights, various different rights, of 11 women who had been arrested in the context of a public demonstration. Uh, these women, they were subject to, uh, to physical and sexual abuse. They were beaten, threatened, and tortured while they uh, were being detained and while also while they were in the detention facilities itself. Um, also, while the court, the Inter-American Court has said, and this is something that the African Commission also, also mentioned, they've said that um, each of these rights, freedom of expression and freedom of, of assembly, that they are their own scope, they are autonomous. Um, it also says that they're intrinsically relation, re, uh, related and a violation of the right to assembly can also affect the right to freedom of expression. In that case, in the Atenko case, the court did mention that if we, that if we wanted to have like a separate violation to the right to freedom of expression, uh, when it concerns the right to protest, it was necessary to demonstrate that the reason why uh, the repression existed or the violation of the assembly existed, it was because of what was said, because of the message of the participants of the protest. Um, yes. 
In another case, the specific issue that I'm mentioning in the case of Lopez Lone and others against Honduras, Honduras, the court also mentioned that while the rights to peaceful uh, assembly and expression are two separate rights, they know that they are they mentioned and they highlighted that they are reinforcing to each other that just basically their scope of application usually intersect. Um, and um, including just like the recognition of the protection of opinion and expression, uh, which is just it, basically this the objective of of, of an assembly. And this specific case is a case uh, related to the military coup in 2009 in Honduras, where four sitting judges from the Association of Judges for Democracy, they were dismissed for expressing their opinions against the overthrow of President uh, Zelaya. And one of the judges, Lopez Lone, participated in a protest denouncing the coup. Um, the second issue, the second legal issue that I wanted to highlight about the Warsaw decision is that is with regards to the restrictions to protest. And Special Rapporteur Wule mentioned the requirements, basically the, rec uh, the requisites to limit this right. Um, and in this case, the African Commission also reiterated international standards that this right, in order to, it's not absolute and it can be subject to restrictions only when um, such restrictions are prescribed by law, they pursue one or more of the legitimate aims that he clearly detailed and that it must be necessary for a democratic society. Throughout the whole jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court and the Inter-American Commission, they've reiterated this point. Um, but I, and I wanted to just highlight that in the case of Lopez Lone against Honduras, they did stress that protest demonstrations aimed at defending democracy and opposing the breakdown of constitutional order, basically have a high, have a high protection under the American Convention. Um, yes. And then the third point, and the one that I wanted to highlight the most, and it's one of the main themes of this panel, is um, that the African Commission um, did highlight, they talked a lot about the um, notification and authorization regime. And this is specifically an issue that the inter-American system has yet to address. We don't have a case at the commission level or the court level addressing the specific issue. Um, the African Commission in the WUSA decision, it emphasized that states basically, basically have to ensure that the right to organize peaceful protests is not restricted uh, by any undue bureaucratic obligations and even beyond that, that states have to ensure that freedom, uh, that this freedom is enjoyed in a practical matter. They have to create and guarantee an environment that allows, that invites people to exercise this right, right? It, the environment around uh, the civic space has to be conducive in order to exercise these rights. They, people should not fear prosecution, should not fear fear violence in order when they're exercising these rights. This is a specific obligation that is highlighted in this decision. And it's, it's also stated in the guidelines from the commission and it's providing some, just basically some guidance to state to, um, to, to how to do that, to respect these rights and to allow it exercise. And also linked to this, the commission also basically clearly stated that people just don't need an authorization to exercise the right to assembly that in fact, if groups or individuals do not give notice, even if the domestic law, law stipulates that they have to, uh, that doesn't justify the state's interference with the exercise of freedom of, of assembly. Um, so all of what the commission did in this specific point, it is it, it recalled the guidelines of freedom of association and assembly in Africa, the guidelines that, that they have published in previous years. And just, reiterated that states have to ensure the protection of all assemblies for interference, from interference, from harassment, from intimidation, from attacks from third parties, and just elevated the standards captured in, on those guidelines uh, in this case. Um, so as I mentioned, neither the commission or the inter-American court have addressed this issue of authorization regimes or notifications in a specific case. But right now, uh, we're sort of in a free WOSA phase of the inter-American system. We do have detailed um, like standards explained and compilated in thematic reports. 
um, similar to what the African Commission with their guidelines. So we, uh, in 2019, the OAS Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression uh, published our report on protest and human rights and relied heavily on the standards uh, set up by uh, UN Special Rapporteurs on Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and also relied heavily on the guidelines from the African Commission. So this just cross-pollination of standards, as Angelita Bayens from RFK has, <laughs> has uh, phrased it, this cross-pollination of standards, uh, we can see it in this issue, for example, specifically, and in on the right to protest, where the inter-American system relies on the standards set up by the UN, by the African system, and also analyzing general restrictions to freedom of expression and applying it to, to protests. So uh, in this specific, for example, in this specific report, they do um, detail some of the standards that Special Rapporteur uh, Vule mentioned at the beginning that just basically that prior notice cannot function as a, basically as a covert authorization regime. That they have to, that states have this obligation to ensure that there's an environment that allows for the exercise of, 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 of the right to protest. They've also emphasized that um, when you have to notify authorities in advance about the place, date, time of the protest, it is only compatible with the American convention uh, when states require it in order to guarantee the protection of protesters, right? To, and it's basically to guarantee the exercise of this right. Um, and, this and that this notification regime, again, as Robert Vule mentioned, cannot like if it's overly bureaucratic, it can have a chilling effect on these rights. Um, so just basically, if they don't give notification, and this is something the commission also reiterated, they don't give notification, this should not lead to the breakup of the gathering or to the imposition of criminal or administrative penalties. They've also mentioned that spontaneous demonstrations are also protected, that notification procedures cannot also just, they're not like a binding commitment by the associations or the individuals that are protesting. It's not a commitment by the organizers to the time, place and manner of the notification that they gave. Um, so that, that, those were the, like the three main points that I wanted to highlight about the, about the decision. And the third point, the third big point that I just wanted to make was it's just a very brief concluding point uh, that, as you can see, the inter-American system is in this just pre waza phase where we are yet to start applying to specific cases the standards detailed in soft law like we, and, and documents such as thematic reports. And it's useful to have guidelines, but it's also useful to have uh, that the experience, for example, that the African system has had uh, where they um, have applied those guidelines to specific cases and the experience, we hope that the experiences from the African system will hopefully and well positively influence the jurisprudence of the inter-American system and eventually impact the reality of people in the Americas when these decisions start being incorporated in national law, when the state start seeing through these guidelines and applying it in a rights respecting way to their own realities and um, just basically restrictions and threats to the right to protest, such as the ones that we heard from, uh, from Jesse and Rose, just, and like also Rapporteur uh, Boule mentioned, this is just, a, uh, this is a global trend of restrictions. This is something that's happening around the world, around the Americas, where different types of intimidation, different types of threats, different types of tactics that we've seen that evolve through time that are used to restrict this, this rights. And um, we're seeing it, we hope that these decisions can, uh, can influence possibly in, in, the in the local jurisprudence, both at the inter-American system, but also locally. And we will keep an eye out, we will work together alongside uh, Rose, Jesse, and other fierce advocates to ensure that the recommendations that were made are implemented to find innovative ways to, for this to be implemented and just to continue to share lessons learned from litigants from around the world, advocates to foster, foster 
that collaboration and inspire strategic litigation similar to with what we what we've discussed today. Um, I'll stop there just to ensure that we have time for dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, interesting to get the regional perspective um, and to think a bit more about cross pollination, as you say. Um, so we've heard from uh, all the panelists. It's been a, a rich um, input from everyone. They've all given us some food for thought. Again, for those who are participating, you can use the Q&A um, icon at the bottom to type your questions. Um, we do have a few questions um, that have come in. So we're going to transition now to the interactive panel um, with all of the panelists who are here. Um, uh, Clement and Jenny and Sophia, I think Rose has left. <clears throat> and we've got um, some questions. If I can just read out a few that have, have come in. Um, Clement, we have a few for you and I'll, I'll, I'll abuse my position as the, the moderator to ask you also about um, you know, how you see the UN and the ACHPR and the inter-American system as well, um, working together um, to kind of push forward, um, you know, some of the reforms and the standards on, on that. But some other questions that have come in for you, Clément, I can maybe read them all out and then we can take some time. Um, besides violent repression, what do you see as the biggest challenge or the trending threat to the right to peaceful assembly around the world? Um, and then another question for you is, what would you say is the scale of repression on online mobilization and dissent, especially um, in the post-COVID pandemic world? I know that the UN, you, your office had done a lot around the pandemic. Um, we have a question for Jenny as well. For 10 years, you've led protests despite government repression. What role do you think civil society in other countries, maybe in the region or further afield, um, what can they do to support your work and to put pressure on the government for reforms? Um, and then a question for Sophia um, is, uh, we see attacks on civic space um, generally and protests in particular around elections. Um, are there some countries where you see or expect escalations in future elections? And what can CSOs do to use the WASA decision to push the advancement of jurisprudence in the region? So um, perhaps, Clément, we can start with you. I hope you got the questions. If not, I'm happy to, to repeat. Um, please go ahead. Um. Yes, Arvin, can you hear me? Okay, so um, I mean, I, I will probably ask you to repeat maybe the second question. I got the others, but the second question. Okay, the second one was about um, uh, what do you see as like one of the main trending, um, sorry, one of the, hold on, let me look for it again. Um, besides violent repression, what is the biggest challenge or trending threat to the right to peaceful assembly that you've seen around the world? Like, is there a common um, threat or trend? Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> the, uh, in regard, I, I want to ask maybe before uh, alluding on some of this, um, the question or uh, clarification that people ask to also say that I was a little bit shocked by the um, uh, by the letter that Jenny was talking about in relation to the uh, if I understood well the National Human Rights Commission of Zimbabwe. I was shocked in a way that um, the the articulation of the letter itself it's uh, it, it's put really be in question. Uh, the reason why national human rights institutions have status before the African Commission. 
and and, and also uh, the reason why this commission has also uh, their status before the international. And I don't think the. I mean, I, I would like to have a full letter if possible, um, because I work closely with international human rights institution. I would like also to understand uh, what we, what we really um, the articulation, because I find it shocking and troubling to for a commission to say that they cannot uh, that uh, the decision is slowly um, uh, the follow up the decision is uh, is for the victim. I mean, which I think that the state the observer status. Uh, exactly, uh, is them to really say to the Commission, to the uh, National Human Rights Institution, that one of their responsibility also is to be able to work with the Commission to advance the Commission decision at the local level. So, please, if you can share this with me, then I, I will be able also to kind of um, uh, ask more information to you know exactly what is the reason. And, and the first, in relation to the um, my work with the, the uh, Inter-American Commission, but also African Commission, in order to advance um, the right to peaceful assembly, but also some of those progressive decisions, and I would say really important decision of the commission in this case. As you know, in 20, since I took the mandate first in, in 2018, one of my priorities is how do we, do we strengthen the, the the collaboration between the national the international system and the regional system in order for for, for us to tackle the global challenge of the situation of CSAs around the world. And um, since 2019, we have been issued joint declaration, and you can see actually we are on our third joint declaration, and our upcoming one will be in September. And we have, we have also moved quite uh, well recently in uh, Poland, where we adopt what we call a uh, joint strategic work uh, with the African Commission, the aspect of the African Commission dealing with uh, peaceful assembly and association, the, the, the inter-American system, the ASEAN system, but also uh, the uh, European system. And the idea really is, is to say that since we are, we are facing a global challenge of the restriction of civic space. It's important also to design global strategy to counter that. So the strategy decision for me is important, and I'm sure we will be also discussing this within our framework, our, our, our space of dialogue and space of sharing best practices, and I'm sure we will be discussing this. And also that, um, as you know myself, I was engaged quite a lot in uh, and since my visit in Zimbabwe, and one of the things that I was insisting before the authority is the, the need really to, uh, to, to change policies, but also the practice towards the, the peaceful assembly. That this right is a fundamental freedom. Is it a right that enables citizens to be able to participate in the building conducive, peaceful, and democratic society? And if the right to peaceful assembly should not be seen as a threat uh, to the national security, it should not be seen as a threat to the authorities. And I have been advocating, this is why since then, I have been also challenging some of the laws that are, are, are in place. And uh, I'm really sorry again to hear that uh, um, although some of my contacts and my meetings uh, that um, the, the, the government uh, adopts the new law on, on the criminal code, which I, I will be again, um, uh, again uh, expressing myself publicly because I have done what I can in private, privately meeting with some authorities to try to push back. Uh, the, the, this is really, really unfortunate. And the second, second thing that I want also is to, to say in relation to the first question is that um, our approach is both to continue to remind states about the importance of this right, but also at the same time offering our, our technical advice, but also our support to improve the situation. This is why uh, when I visit Zimbabwe, when I come back, I issue recently uh, the status of the follow-up of my recommendation, which I offer again the government to be able also to discuss this and to, to discuss ways in which government should uh, implement some of the recommendations to ensure um, uh, to create a conducive environment for peaceful protest and the right to association. 
And this is the same thing that we have been doing uh, within all of the system, including African Commission and IHA. So we will continue to do this, this work. Uh, the second question you ask beside the repression, what is the, the one of the main challenges? And I think for me, uh, like, like I mentioned, um, the, 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 it depends also on some of the countries. And I think today the regime of authorization and notification is the one really uh, that we need to look closely as one of, one of the, uh, the trigger of the repression. For example, if you are in a country where uh, you, you, you have in the law the regime of notification, but this notification go with lengthy uh, requirement to pay. Either at the end, people will say, we will not go, we will not be able to meet all of these requirements, so there is no way we can protest. Or people will say, in any case, even if we offer those lengthy documents, government will always find something that is not reasonable, or they will always uh, 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 prevent us to protest. So we go to the street without following any rule. So then what it triggers is it triggers a question. So when there is no clarity that the regime of notification is there in order to make sure that law enforcement can take necessary measures to facilitate the protest, it creates uh, 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 it creates this incentive of repression because then the law enforcement will always justify that this is unauthorized, this is unlawful because you did not fulfill the requirement, and also or either if it's an authorization, then because you didn't receive. A, a, uh, 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 express authorization from the government. So I think that that's one of the issues that we should, and, and this is a, this discussion is coming, is also the issue of notification and versus uh, authorization. Um, and uh, the, the, the last question you talk about online, and I think since the COVID 19, we have been able also to see the scale of uh, online repression and online uh, um, surveillance that uh, civil society is facing. And we know many standards that uh, go to the, the use of spyware and all of these things that they uh, prevent or, uh, or create this chilling effect of civil, for civil society to, to protest. Because it's become quite cheap for some law enforcement, just a police or, or, or intelligence service person to sit uh, uh, on the computer and to survey everyone, people that are exchanging about the peaceful protest, about organizing protests on, on online. And the surveillance is, is also one of the big challenge today because when people go to the streets to protest, they also want to protect their own uh, privacy. That's why they are going to in the group. But we know that um, today with this surveillance, with, uh, 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 with uh, CCTV cameras and other uh, spyware uh, 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 um, uh, uh, implements, it becomes really impossible for people now to protest and to protect their privacy. So for me, I, I'm seeing increased use of online space to cartel protest or to prevent even people. We have also the internet shutdown, which, which I raised in my report, uh, which still continue in many countries. The ECOWAS court at that time also issued a decision and saying that such uh, shutdown of internet, and it was the case in the case of Togo, is a violation of uh, the right for uh, the right for organizer to, to, to freedom of expression and to freedom of assembly. So let me stop there, and then uh, 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 I'm happy also to come in again. If, uh, Thank you so much, Clemon. Um, it's true, surveillance and internet shutdowns are um, now a big thing. Um, Jenny, let's move to you. We have only four minutes left until our time is up. So um, your question, I think you know it. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. A wonderful question. I think civic society really have played a very key role in helping us expose the injustices uh, that we have suffered uh, since we formed in 2002. Um, that role is very important as and when there are arrests, uh, trial and post-trial, and then, you know, in assisting where possible to put together, for example, our lives would be very different if after 
we were released from custody and uh, uh, trials were stopped or not. And someone assisted us to take actions against the police, we would have received compensation. It would be a very different story. So that, that's uh, um, a number one thing. Um, what I also wanted to, to say, and it bring, it's sort of a way to answer the question that came, is one of the midterm reactions that we noticed the police doing before they went, um, when they stopped the notification and they stopped the charges around protest, is to find ways to use prosecution as a persecution. So for example, still within the statute books in Zimbabwean court, there is a case against me for kidnap and theft. The person who testified in my trial said she wasn't kidnapped. And the item that I'm supposed to have stolen belonged to me and was given back to me and was part of the court record. And I know many human rights defenders have also suddenly found strange legal cases against them as a way to stop them from continuing to defend human rights. So I think it's just that um, other point that I wanted to add to uh, Rose's presentation. And, you know, sometimes when we are human rights defenders funds, they will then say they cannot deploy a human rights lawyer for a case because it's a criminal case. And then unfortunately you will find yourself facing persecution because you're a human rights defender, but you cannot secure support on a human rights basis because it's supposed to be a criminal case. So these are some of the loopholes they use. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jenny. Um, Sophia, well, I'm going to turn to you for your final words and um, just to talk about the next webinars and I will, Thank everyone for joining in advance. Um, this uh, webinar has been really interesting. Thank you to all the panelists for joining. Um, and Sophia, I'll, I'll hand over to you for the final words before we close. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, no, just a few notes on that. This is um, the first webinar of a series of webinars related to civic space. Uh, the next one will be about the effects of violence against women journalists, and the next one will be centered on freedom of um, association in Uganda and Venezuela. So we'll post, uh, we'll send more information out, and we hope we can continue having this, uh, some, some more cross-regional conversations to reinforce standards, to help promote just collaborative and innovative ways to uh, within civil society. That's it. Thank you everyone for your time. Okay. Thank you. And just a thank you also to the interpreters and to the audience as well for joining us today. Thank you again, Clement, Jenny and Sophia and Rose for joining um, and to the organizers as well. Enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, night. <laughs>